really great to have you all here, and thanks so much for uh, sharing your works with us. Um, let's start with Hans Ulrich. Um, you, do you want to tell us a bit more about... Um, well, so you are exhibiting a nine-hour loop of interviews that you have um, done with Edward Gleeson. Um, do you want to just sort of first start off by just giving us an introduction to that work and your relationship with Gleeson and his kind of importance in your own sort of thought and curatorial practice? Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. And uh, uh, actually, the conversations with Edouard Gleeson have only been shown once before in uh, Arles, at uh, Luma Arles, actually earlier this summer in, a, in an exhibition we made. Uh, thank you. In an exhibition we made. And so, um, it's, yeah, it's the second time we show these films. They've just been subtitled. And it's really the, the nine conversations I had with Edouard uh, from the moment we met around uh, 1999 to the moment when Edouard passed away. And the last conversation actually happened in London um, when we invited Edouard to the Serpentine. Uh, and he wanted to be in, in conversation with uh, Linton Crazy Johnson. So I want to also mention here uh, the amazing Linton Crazy Johnson because you will see in the last video, Edouard in conversation. It's kind of a performance they did, uh, they did together. And I'm particularly happy that we can show the films here because the films have a lot to do with utopia. And I kind of ask Glisson a lot about, I mean, obviously the way we met was actually through my interest in his unrealized uh, art institution, no? because he wanted to do this museum for Martinique, which would, as he told me, not house a synthesis. Uh, so the museum not as a synthesis, but as a network of interrelationships. So he wanted to create a museum which would not only point at urgencies, but find agency to respond to these urgencies. And he imagined it to be a quivering place, which I think is very beautiful. The idea not that an art institution can be, could be, will be a quivering place which transcend established systems of thought. And most importantly, what he really wanted with this you know, unrealized institution is to, to always look for the utopian point where basically all the world, uh, cultures, all the world, you know, voices can be in touch or can be in contact with each other. And starting from there, I then asked him about, you know, utopia. And, um, and I thought here in the context, it would be maybe interesting to talk a little bit about the Glissantian notion of utopia, because I think it's a very different notion of utopia than uh, utopias like Thomas More's utopia, because he criticized these utopias to be static system. He wanted an idea of an utopia which would be a continuous dialogue. Um, and maybe it's interesting actually to go back to a book Glisson wrote, which I think I wanted to recommend you all, which is one of my favorite books of his. It's a novel uh, from 1999 called Sartorius where Glisson describes the utopian Batutu people uh, deriving identity not from a genealogy, but solely from being in constant exchange with others. So, and it's there really that he refers to the utopia as quivering or also as trembling. Uh, and you will see there is a whole video, uh, one of these nine videos is about the trembling, the idea of the, I mean, it's in French, it's the idea of the tremblement. Uh, most of the interviews are in French and then subtitled in English. Um, and here is the quote um, about Utopia as a tremblement. Glissant told me that it must be said from the start that trembling uh, is not uncertainty and that trembling is not fear. Uh, the trembling thought, and in my opinion, says Glissant, every Utopia passes through this kind of trembling thought, is first of all the instinctive feeling that we must reject all categories of fixed thought and all categories of imperial thought. You know, hence the criticism of many, uh, you know, utopias which he considers to be fixed and, and imperial. Christian says the all world trembles. The all world trembles physically. The all world trembles geologically. The all world trembles mentally. The all world trembles spiritually. Because the all world is looking for the point, not the station, but the utopian point where all the world's cultures, all the world's imaginations can meet and hear one another without dispersing or losing themselves. So it's actually not only, as I said before, the place where all the world's cultures can meet, but it's also a point or, you know, a place where all the world's imaginations can meet. Yeah, maybe that is a beginning. 
Yeah, it really is. And I mean, for me, it's been really, what I, th I mean, thank you so much for the contribution of, of the videos to this event. It's been one of the great joys for me of preparing for the event. I've, ha I've been able to just spend hours and hours in, in the loop. So I mean, I, I, I couldn't recommend it highly enough. Get up to the Tagore room and go and um, discover Glisson if you don't know him already. And, and, and if you do, um, go and enjoy. Um, at one o'clock today, so straight out of this room, um, if, if you uh, are, would like to go and see O Horizon by the Otolith Collective, you'll be able to just um, it, uh, go straight out to the Barn Cinema. Um, Kojo, is your mic working? Um, yeah. It is? I think it Great. is, Great. Yeah. Can you um, tell us a little bit about, um, about the making of O Horizon? Sure. Um, so, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, my name is Koja Eshen. I'm one half of the Otolith group with my colleague and partner, Angelika Saga. Let's just check that Angelika's not here. Yeah, who not will, here. will be here soon with uh, Drexy, um, the Spanish water dog. <laughs> So to put O Horizon in context, um, it's a study of uh, the life and the work, um, the moods, and a kind of portraiture of the campus of Shantiniketan, which is in West Bengal, about four and a half hours outside of Calcutta. Um, it's founded in the 1920s as an art school by the, the polymath Rabindranath Tagore who has a, you know, a, a profound relationship with the place we are actually situated in right now, the relation with Dorothy and Leonard Elmhurst, um, and who all, all of whom share a kind of um, a desire to experiment with modes of education, modes of art, and modes of life. Um, and so um, as a commission, um, for this exhibition called Bauhaus Imaginista, which was an exhibition curated by Grant Watson, the curator, and the curator Marion van Osten, we were invited to, um, to respond to um, Shantini Caton, which was a project that we've been thinking about for a decade. Um, so Tagore and um, Shantini Caton holds a, a massive place in um, Bengali culture and in Indian art history. Tagore was a profound polymath, um, a writer, a novelist, a playwright, a dramatist, um, wrote the words to the national anthem. So, in a way, it's, it can't be an art historical film that claims knowledge of Tagore's historical role. For that, you would go and look at um, Satyajit Ray's great film, The Inner Eye, which is a portrait of... Uh, of Tagore and of Ray's time spent at Shantini Caton. So it's not so much a question of our history. It's, it's not even a question of biography, nor is it a question of hagiography. It's more a question of Shantini Caton at a moment in time in 2018, um, a moment just before Modi will appoint um, a BJP affiliate as the president of Shantini Caton thus effectively creating a certain kind of interdiction over the whole campus, such that the, the staff are really unable to, to um, carry out a lot of the progressive activities that they would wish for. So in a way, we were there at the very last moment before the BJP um, were able to extend its hold over Shantini Caton and, and you know, carry out their project of effectively destroying the kind of secularity of Indian political and cultural life. So we were there at that last moment. So what you see is a kind of portrait of Shantini Caton, and what we were concerned to do was to bring together um, a study of poetry, a study of writing, a study of performance, with the um, ecological interventions into soil, into plant life, into the health of the soil. Um, so in a way, it was a study both of Shantini Ketan, the school, and of Sri Niketan, the school, which is dedicated to what people call rural revivalism. And maybe a way to bring this together is in the very term O Horizon itself, which is a term that soil scientists use to describe the surface layer of the earth. So yesterday, Paul Gulliver was talking about 
attending to the soil as the ground that you're standing on. Welcome, Anjali. Welcome, Drexy. This is Anjali, the other half of uh, Otolith Collective. Come on, take, take a seat there. This is Drexy. Hi. I didn't realize I was supposed to see you. <laughs> All good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's good. That's cool. <laughs> um, Koji, go on. Do you want to wrap up? Yeah. And we can maybe have Anjali. So I'll just in. finish it, yeah. just talking about O Horizon. So um, yesterday, Paul Gilroy was talking about attending to the soil as the ground on which you are standing from, as the way to think through a kind of um, uh, a kind of um, uh, a renewed sense of the parochial as a as a as a renewal of a politics of location. Um, and so, in a way, what we did was to attend to the strata of the soil in Shantiniketan, in which the O horizon as the surface layer is the visible form of, of the strata. So soil scientists talk about the O horizon, the A horizon, mm -hmm. the B horizon, the C horizon, and the E horizon. And the E horizon is reaching the bedrock. So soil scientists think in terms of this kind of strata of life. But for us, it's a question of, um, of thinking, the no thinking the idea of the health of the soil in relation to the colonial project of the robbery of the soil. So Marx, Marx talks a lot about the robbery of the soil in Ireland, the British occupation of Ireland uh, the monocropping culture, culture of Ireland in, enforced by the British means the robbery of the health of the soil. Tagore also talks about the robbery of the soil. So talking to soil scientists means um, uh, that we looked a lot at um, the efforts of young soil scientists to care for the soil and the health of the soil in Shantiniketan, and that under conditions of capitalogenic climate crisis, soil becomes something like a battlefield in which you can read the anthropogenic contestation, you can read the botanical conflicts that are at play right now across the planet. And so, in a way, Shantiniketan becomes a kind of scale version of these large global questions. So by, by, by spending time in Shantiniketan and in Srinikaitan and in the surrounding areas, we were able to produce a kind of, a kind of audiovisual study and a kind of portrait of, of some of these uh, conflicts and contestations. Great. Anjali, you were telling me yesterday that your uh, connection to Shantiniketan is very personal. Do you want to tell us a bit more about that? Um, Yes, I mean, there is a biographical uh, rationale or kind of entry point into why we wanted to um, think about Shantiniketan in the present and Tagore. Um, I mean, Tagore was a figure for many Indian modernists involved with, um, uh, you know, the, um, the Quit India movement and involved with independence. Uh, if you like, there was a non-aligned, the non-aligned movement of which my family in India were part of, in terms of thinking, um, thinking around Pan-Asianism as a kind of, as a kind of pre-colonial, let's say, well, pre-British colonial, um, uh, um, let's say, scene. Um, the 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 political movement of non-alignment is one you know, is one thing which is highly complex. And all of our work has, from the beginning has been thinking around non-aligned images and non-aligned sounds, um, let's say. But the, uh, in relation to Shantiniketan and, the, and why it sort of, let's say, the biographical and the reason, um, reasoning in this moment, um, well, in 2018, and I'd say over the last 15 years, I'd say, is because Tagore was a Pan-Asianist, um, and he and and his Pan-Asianism for me, kind of, opened up what it actually meant to become independent um, in India at that time. So, 
my grand aunt went to Shanti Niketan, but also a lot of, um, and so that's important that uh, Tagore created a, a, a school for women because the British had, let's say, um, let's say they had, uh, they had um, desacralized the arts um, for women. So many women involved in India's independence movement and leading up to it uh, were trained in the sciences or um, were nation builders. So the arts was seen as something that was not really something to get involved with. Um, and, uh, sorry, he's very distracting. But um, the, but so my father is also an artist and his, uh, many of his influences, or let's say the way that I grew up, the way that he created a scene, the way that he created an atmosphere in the house, the, the, his capabilities. He wasn't an upper class guy. He was a, from a working class family that came to Delhi and partition and went to art school unlike my mother who comes from a sort of leftist sort of elite freedom movement India fam Indian family. Um, he was, you know, he, he knew how to m do things. He knew how to build, he knew how to paint and draw, and he knew how to, he, knew, he, he understood space, he understood food, he understood people. And it's, um, he died recently and I think I was always trying to bring these two ends of India together, which were somehow in my parents, like these from these two different worlds. Um, and I realized that Tagore actually created an environment for people to not only um, understand or think about their use of their hands and their use of the relation to land or their relationship to... Um, to space, but it was also a kind of Pan-Asian um, and, and, pa and Eurasian environment, if you like. Um, and it still is. So in that, the, all the, there's different languages um, taught in Shantiniketan, there's different dance forms taught in Shantiniketan. But Tagore isn't necessarily, t when he's, I mean, he's a choreographer as well, so the dances that you see in O Horizon are not, all, uh, are not necessarily what you'd imagine Indian classical dance to be, because actually he's more influenced by Music Hall and Swan Lake, in a way, than he is by Bharatnatyam, let's say. Um, and so he has this very eclectic, um, let's say, um, like series of references that, you know, masks that were brought back from Japan, uh, many objects, uh, t uh, and um, Tagore and his students uh, would think with. So I think for me it was like trying to, for us it was trying to understand this ethos in a work because India is under Modi's control, uh, occupation, India is under the occupation of another force which is called Hindutva. And, you know, Shanti Niketan is um, under siege. He's the vice chancellor. We got in in a moment when there was the, vi the vice chancellor was a Tagorean philosopher, and she allowed us to shoot there. So nobody had ever shot, you know, in the dance academy. Nobody had ever, not for a good, I don't know, how long, Koji, maybe 50 years or something. Um, so we actually managed to work with this uh, standing vice-chancellor, is that what you'd call it? Um, and every morning we had, to, we had to go and see her at 6.30 a.m. and she'd um, write us a letter. And that letter had to go through, you know, it's old bureaucracies. And so we were actually in this kind of, you know, let's say interregnum in a way between, in this moment between old Shanti Niketan and, you know, let's say, um, you know, the erasure, the potential erasure of Shanti Niketan under Modi, because uh, he's now the vice chancellor, as I said. So for me, it felt like an urgent moment to think about the space, but it's not a, when you see the film, it's not a, um, it's not a hagiography of Tagore. It is not a documentary about Shanti Niketan. It is thinking with the structure of feeling of Shanti Niketan in the present and in the past. We didn't want to put timings on things and say this is now and this was then. Um, we wanted more to think with the active space that is still, you know, in, you know, that is still um, all, the, all the classes, all the dance, the dance school classes, the rehearsals, the architecture itself. We wanted to, I would say, think rhythmically with all of these spaces and with that rhythm, if you like, 
um, try and touch upon the Tagorean ethos as an ecosophist and choreographer and writer. That's great. Thanks so much, Anjali and Kojo. And so at one o'clock, uh, you will uh, be able to walk across the Barn Cinema and uh, see O Horizon, and please do. Um, after which, uh, you'll be able to catch Himali So and Sings, uh, We Are Opposite Like That. Um, how's your mic doing, Himali? Um, does it work? It works. Yes. Um, can you tell us a bit about, um, about your work on We Are Opposite Like That? Please. Yeah, so we are opposite like that occurs in the North and South Pole. Uh, although it's not so far away from South Asia or everywhere, I went there thinking it's like a distant elsewhere, but very quickly you realize that it's an entangled here. Uh, the larger we are opposite like that, uh, ex kind of exists on the conceit that these were uninhabited parts of the world that I visited. And the, uh, my guides kept telling me there are no myths and there are no stories here. And I quickly realized that it felt like the ice was this indigenous elder. Ice preserves all of these stories. And it was for a long time being able to do this decolonial work of pushing the whalers' graves up, of um, evaporating permafrost that then revealed uh, extracted marble, which then turned to dust in a perfectly um, ironic way. Um, but it no longer can do that work. It's losing that strength. So it, um, the, the multitude of stories from We Are Opposite Like That exist from the perspective of ice itself as a kind of elder. And these stories, because it's a landscape where despite the clarity of glacial water, the mist sets in and the fog sets in and you can't see anything. And not knowing becomes a way of knowing. Uh, you look up and the stars are gone too, so, and the chronometer fails. And then how do you know where to go? You listen to the kidneys. So um, truth is anybody's game in this landscape. So the stories uh, span from uh, crashed uh, hot air balloons and love letters that have spilt there. So I enter with speculative fiction, giving life to some of these letters. Um, there is a South Asian Futurism Manifesto connect, connecting uh, Antarctica's fossils to India's fossils when it existed uh, sort of simultaneously in Pangaea. Uh, there's an amazing story of an Indian clairvoyant from Calcutta that was used by the British Empire as a clairvoyant to travel to the Arctic in search of Franklin and his 130 lost men because she was dark-skinned and uneducated. So it kind of um, opens out these archives and tells these stories. Um, the film that you will watch is uh, two parts. There's me in this kind of alien character. I become this brown body confronted by the whitest landscape, feeling this kind of alienness alienness, but also this deep empathy with I, so much so that this character begins to transform in a kind of Ovidian way into ice itself. But then the climate change narrative is not so simple because she reaches a coal mine, and in that coal mine she sees its blackness and recognizes herself in it. And its speculative heat makes her feel more at home in her equatorial self than anywhere else. So in a glissant kind of way, she's also grappling with her being multiple. And then the archival part of the story in the film that you watch, maybe, hopefully, is um, the very popular Victorian fear and panic that the Arctic ice would descend into Britain and take it over, leave it into a frosted wasteland, and therefore mean, it would mean the end of the empire. So it, uh, there's depictions of polar bears on the Thames. And this was, um, this was a, apparently a very um, popular, popular belief. Um, and also mixed in with all of these beliefs is uh, the complication of where science begins to fail and then the occult rises. And uh, maybe here is the gap where I'll leave you with it and where you'll enter into 
the film. Amazing. I mean, it's just a, it's just an extraordinary piece of work. So we are opposite like that. We'll play uh, in the Barn Cinema between O Horizon and Ruth Wilson Gilmore's Earth Talk. It's also part of the uh, artist film and video loop, which is playing at different times in the Barn Cinema. And if you're unable to catch that, it's on. It's available online until midnight tomorrow. Um, as is um, uh, Tandy Lawrenson's work on the Zambian Space Project. How's your mic doing, Tandy? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Could you join to just I will. launch in? Yeah. <laughs> I will. I will. Um, firstly, you know how they say you should never meet any of your heroes? Or like, what if you find them all in one room <laughs> over one weekend? <laughs> so I'm grappling with... Bear with me. <laughs> Um, I'm kind of struck how in this conversation there's a number of figures that are emerging and are kind of tethering to these figures or relations to these figures. And maybe I'll add a, another one, which is uh, a figure also who I would say, as, as you said, Kojo, is experimenting with modes of life um, and feeling out for how we can read and engage and relate to and with the earth. Um, and this is a figure of the Director General of the Zambian Space Program, Edward Festus Mukuka and Colosso. And this program emerged around the time of Zambian independence, so around 1964, and, um, and is quite fascinating for a number of reasons. I was just saying before we came on how the space program has come to figure as a kind of oddity, as a, as a sort of fascinating weirdness, really. Um, but but what, what is missed in, in that work is its embeddedness within the project of Zambian liberation. Mm. And tied to that was, or central to that rather, was uh, an abolitionist project. So the abolition of private property and the abolition or the nationalization of the, of the mines, um, which had been steeped in logics of privatization and of colonialization that saw particular forms of, of land use and by whom those forms of land use were conceived and to, to whom they were made available, uh, associated with racialized categories of whiteness and of human humanity. Um, and those who were excluded, so black Africans in this case, were seen as raw materials and were cast as inhuman within that project. So the Zambian uh, independence project was really trying to reshake, um, restructure relations between people and between people in the earth. And this was done in large part through this abolition project, through this nationalization project. But I've put it that the space program was actually central to this project too, and was part of a project of recrafting a narrative in which black Africans were ourselves no longer seen as raw materials, but were rather um, agents on and in and in relation to Earth and could aspire to, could, to, to flourish on Earth and to even greater heights too. Um, so the film is really my um, way of uh, unearthing this, this history and of, of drawing these kinds of relations and quite literally drawing these relations and working through graphite as a medium and as a conduit of um, engaging with that politic. Um, what you won't see in the film, and maybe is, is interesting for this panel on how we connect to forms of organizing, is that this project, this was actually a much smaller part of a much larger project that was cited in the rumor former, former, rumored former headquarters of the space program, which is now the city landfill. So here, talking about kind of digging through layers of soil, here there's over 10 years of untreated, unprocessed um, city landfill that is accumulating. Um, it's one of the last uh, sites in the city that is still in public ownership, a kind of legacy from the, the days of independence where there was this huge public provision of services. And when I was there, I um, was currently going through a process of privatization. And so working with the city council and with um, members of the Waste Recyclers Association who operate on that site, um, we enacted this quite magical, um, fantastical process of reenacting in Colossal's methods through the space program. So a mm -hmm. process of excavating a spaceship that brought various characters and stakeholders in the city together towards conceiving of a public future for the site. So I think that's, yeah, that's the work. <laughs> Can you, um, I mean, this, this concept that we've been sort of talking about in, in the sort of development of this, uh, of this event, like of, of futurism as organising and organising 
as a kind of way of creating new futures. Can you, um, I know that's something that you've been thinking about specifically in relation to the Zambian space project and how, you know, and how that um, resonates with your kind of wider project. Mm. Do you want to say something about that? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think that the, the key thing there is um, that none of this was particularly innovative, right? It was actually what was happening at that time of independence where there were these highly speculative projects and I think a space program and the project of abolition are, are almost on a par in terms of their ambition and their kind of radical mm. approach to how we restructure our reality. Mm. And so it was really about how do we re-engage those modes of thinking? How do we re-inject the speculative and the imaginary and the performative into our political projects um, and into this, into this site? You know what, it's, it's so amazing to have all of you here, to have your work here, but to also have you here, and it feels like just the, the, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, the beginning of a very, uh, of mu a, a, a much longer conversation that we, that we can and we will have. But I, I think that, I think we're gonna stop there and put our hands together, please, for Kojo Eshen, Himali So and Sing. Tandy Lowenson, Hans Ulrich Obris, and Anjali Sagar. Thanks very much. <laughs>